first of all, uh, I just want to say thanks for coming on. I know um, I, I kind of reached out out of the blue. So I appreciate you, you know, uh, taking the time to to sit down and tell me these stories. I was just looking through this bio again right before we got on here, and it's just from the beginning, you know, uh, from the seminary all the way down to being a postmaster. I mean, everything in between is just fascinating to me. So uh, I can't thank you enough, and yeah, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. I mean, this is it's unexpected uh, you know, from point A to point, you know, to the finality of it. It's been a fun and interesting life. You know, it's, it's yeah. I still consider myself um, a minor pawn. I've I've walked amongst giants, you know, some of For the sure. best men in the world. Definitely. Yeah. yeah so <clears throat> take me through. Uh, we can either now there. Like I said, there's so many stories in here. We can go chronologically. I always like to see the background where people started, like how they got in the military, their kind of family life. Um, but we can jump around as much as you want. I mean, there's some just some crazy, fascinating stuff in here. So uh, I'll just let you take the reins and uh, go wherever you want. Okay. Well, you know, the best way to start, as they say, is start from the beginning. Um, <laughs> right. My parents, um, dad was West Texas. Mom was East Texas. Um, dad was, you know, he was, he was born into... Um, he was born poor, you know, is, is, you know, and, and when I say, you know, he was, he was a West Texas, uh, during the, the great depression and during the dust storms, he was raised basically by his aunt. Dad was an athlete. He, uh, he was actually coached by a German basketball coach, um, that was on the Mexican Olympic team in 1936 that took third place um, in in the Olympics in 1936. Wow! And he came over after that, um, got his degree at what is now University of Texas El, El Paso, but back then it was called the, was the University of Mines. I'm not sure. Yeah, it was it was a re precursor to that. And okay. he coached basketball, football, and everything. Um, highly educated man, um, could speak four languages fluently, of course, being on the teams there. But dad, oh, yeah. um, when he graduated high school, he had few options. He was actually given a scholarship to go to um, Saul Ross State University to play football. And he's, you know, here he is, a 16, 17 year old boy. He walks in and, and you know, you know, he's got men that had just gotten out of World War II playing football. He's a, he was like I was when I graduated. He was barely five feet tall, 150 pounds, um, not even quite six feet tall at that time. And he's seeing these World War II veterans playing football, you know, looking like Bronco Nagurski. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he's looking around going, I will be killed. <laughs> so he's, you know, and he's, so he, he got together with uh, one of his friends named Charlie Osborne and talked him into joining, joining the Navy. Um, and, and and they went off on the you know, his, his mom was still around so he he had his aunt forge forge a signature and he joined the navy at that point <laughs> and he was very proud to you know he's like he, he he was called an airedale back then and he was stationed in galveston and he he was the guy that um his job was to land the um pby aircraft okay and yes yeah, yeah there was always you know Always the guy, kind of guys when those things landed, he dove underwater, hooked up the hooked up the PBYs to make sure they they stayed they stayed uh, hooked up. So when the guys took off, he unhooked them and they flew they flew. Um, he was stationed in Galveston when he hit. He met my mom. Mom was an East Texas girl, um, and she her family had been around since after after the Civil War. So they've been in Texas a long time. Wow. Oh, yeah. Um, and so after after my dad got out of service, uh, you know he went he came back to West Texas and the job he had had when when he had left to join the services he was working on the railroad on the um, laying ties and that's all they offered him when he came back you know, you know back breaking work lifting and moving ties and and it is. His dad was actually working up north in, in northwestern Pennsylvania, and he goes, "How's the jobs up there?" He goes, "There's plenty." You know, this is after after Korea, and, and dad was a a Korean War era vet, and he was he's like, "I'm on my way." <laughs> so it was it was yeah, it, there was a yeah there was 
there was my mom who had never seen snow basically before. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and they moved up to Northwestern Pennsylvania in a little teardrop trailer. And first year there, there was, you know, I mean, we're talking a trailer that's not more than five feet high. Right. And you know, the first snow they had there, dad had to bust the door open and shovel <laughs> snow out of the <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, you know, mom stuck with it. They've been up there since 1950. See, my sister was born in 56, 1954, 55. Okay. Yeah, so they were, you know, they're, they're more Pennsylvania now than they were Texan. <laughs> um, I'm a, you know, I'm one of five children. Um, I'm the, I'm the second, the oldest boy. Um, as you see in the bio, I said, my parents, my parents had four wonderful, highly intelligent, highly athletic, um, career motivated kids and me. Right. <laughs> so, um, military wise, you know, I, you know, the joke is I was born with a, you know, with a knife and a rifle in my hand. Um, you know, I, I, I excelled in sports. I didn't really excel in, in public school. Um, my oldest, you know, I, I was the middle child of the first group of kids, um, okay. you know, older sister, younger sister. Right. Um, and so my, my oldest sister, when I say athleticism, um, from her freshman year to her senior year in high school, she played five sports and lettered in all five of them. Wow. She, she went to the um, University of Pennsylvania in Edinburgh, but at that time it was the Edinburgh, um, Edinburgh University. Um, she had two full ride scholarships in in athletics. Wow. And when I'm so when I'm growing up and growing up in high school, it's embarrassing when you're when your coaches go, why can't you be as good of an athlete as your sister? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and my younger and my youngest sister was the most intelligent woman you've ever, I've ever met in my life. Mm. When she graduated high school, before she even graduated high school. You know, she, well, I'll tell you this. Um, she has had, she died about a year and a half ago from cancer, but she had two doctorate degrees. Um, she was the vice president of a very prestigious Ivy League college in Erie, and she was the vice president of a college in Dungarvan, Ireland. Wow. Um, so, yeah, so I had school teachers go, why can't you be as smart as your younger sister? <laughs> <laughs> so here I am going, I need to find a different job. Right. Um, so that's when I was given, I was given a great opportunity. Um, I was very religious at the time being raised Catholic. And so I thought I had a calling, calling to become a priest. And that's when I went to the seminary and that gave me structure. And, you know, so, you know, how public high schools are, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 It's like, we're just going to deluge you with information and, what you what you give us back is how we're going to grade you bell curve at best mm -hmm. um in the seminary for the first time in my life structure happened you know and and if you didn't excel at something you had one on one on one conversations the priest and the nuns took you to the side and said what is going on um adhd was not uh, even a term they used back then Right. But for some reason, the priests understood that. The nuns understood that. So they were able to focus me. Um, you know, have you ever seen kids in high school or if, if you ever grew up when you saw in your, your grade school readouts and you know, they said, Johnny would be a good student if he would just focus. Right. Yeah. You know? And so they understood that in, in the seminary mm -hmm. and they found a way to focus. Um, and by the by the end of that i realized if i had a job where i had structure um and so the military to me was that is something that i can do because there's structure you know right. there's an a there's a b there's a c there's a d um so when Same. i graduated i thought that's where i'm going i didn't know what i was going to do um when it came time for my senior year i really i knew dad was in the navy but he never talked about his service um, so at, at that point, and, and my, and his dad was in the Navy, but neither one of them talked about their service. Right. Um, so it's, it's like, and everything I knew about the Navy was, I didn't want to be on a boat. Right. Um, so it was, so I said, well, 
I had both my uncles and there were both my mom's, my mom's brothers. They loved the army. Um, they were, they were Vietnam, um, era army. And when they say era, they were, they were so blessed in the middle of the Vietnam war, they were stationed in Germany. <laughs> it was like, um, so I'm like, well, army seems to be the way to go. Um, and so it was in October of my senior year. Um, I was working at the, at, I was working for Sears in their warehouse branch and guys who were, you know, who were getting me a, about my age and they're asking me, Oh, well, you're going to join, you're going to go to the military. What branch? And I'm like, I always thought about jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. So I think I'm going to go airborne for a few years. And one of the older guys um, who was working, he was basically fixer, the fixer of the furniture that got broke. And he was an itty bitty guy. And he just walks up, grabs him. And I'm, when I say grabs him by the ear, he, he, he really did grab me by the <laughs> big arts ears. Um, and, and he tells my supervisor at the time, I got little Johnny here. We're going to go have a talk. I got him for the rest of the day and drug <laughs> me back to his little office, slammed the door and said, boy, we're going to have to talk. And he explained that, that he was a pararescue man. And I'm like, what's a pararescue man? Right. And he explained the whole job. And by the end of the eight hour day, I'm now my eyes are wide awake and I go, I want to be a PJ. <laughs> and, and I went to talk to a, you know, so I, the next, within the next week, first day off, I skipped school, went down to an Air Force recruiter and, and said, I want to be a PJ. And you see the weird look on his face and the only, he starts going, what's a PJ? What's a PJ? Yeah, what's a PJ? exactly. <laughs> and, but you know, I, I may have skipped a part during that. My, my dad, when I joined, you know, he, he was, he was happy. He's like, Hey, you, you have a career path that you want to do. You know, the, the Navy was good for me. Go. And he said the two great pieces of advice he gave me was don't listen to scuttlebutt and volunteer for everything, you know, which is usually the opposite of what people say. Don't ever right. volunteer. Right. Um, and, and so in, in basic training, you know, but I'll go back to that. The, the, you know, when I, when the PJs said, come test, the only thing, you know, that, that I was able to do that didn't, I didn't understand was, you know, they said, okay, first thing, push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups, knocked them right out. Right. That's, that's what I did in high school. Um, two mile run and you have to do it under 12 minutes. <laughs> okay. yeah. Ooh, 10 minutes later. <laughs> like, All right. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Swim. <laughs> it's like, and the first thing is we need you to do the, the standard one, like the pool underwater. And nobody said underwater that wasn't in the job description and i failed horribly you know i did yeah. do i was probably 10 feet short each time because mm -hmm. i didn't understand you know underwater right. um and so um you know and i and i listened to my dad's advice about um don't listen to scuttlebutt and volunteer for everything so when I go into basic training, you know, the first thing I, I listened to was, you know, I, I raised my hand on 16 August, 1977, and I land at Lackland Air Force Base. You know, we fly in, we're met, we're put on the bus, we go in, and the first thing I hear is Elvis died. And of course, I'm like, don't listen to Scuttlebutt. It's all a lie. Right. <laughs> and, and if you look back, you, you Google Elvis. The day he died was 16 August, 1977. It wasn't two wow. weeks later before I'm like, well, shit. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> um, but volunteering, you know, they said, we need, we need 12 volunteers um, for, for something special. I'll do it. <laughs> um, and at the time there was no joint anything, you know, mm -hmm. the, the women in the air force were separated from the men in the air force. No two ways. Well, I waltzed up, raised my hand, and you know, of course, everybody in the flight was like, "You're dumb. You don't volunteer for anything." <laughs> we got volunteered to go to the mess kitchen and do cleanup in the women's barracks. <laughs> it's like, ooh, <laughs> girls. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I made three dates. <laughs> it was nice. Like, yeah, to meet him at the movie theaters on your time off. Sure. And so. I had conversations. Those guys are like, oh, you're dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Lucky SOBs. Um, <laughs> right. And then the next thing you know, we, we need volunteers. Raise my hand. 
how fast can you run? Well, I was in track and I did this, this, and this. And so I got recognized because, you know, we got, we got on the, you know, we got time to do, take enough time to take off to be on a, the squadrons meeting each other against tracks, track nice. specialties and track teams. But, um, of course, being open general, it was, you know, it was that time to make your decision. What do you want to be? And, mm-hmm. you know, I said, yeah, so, well, I, I want to get in the medical field because that's what PJs do. All right. And of course, I put in everything medical. And then needs of the Air Force, oh, you're going to be a security specialist. You know, what's a hell of a security specialist? Oh, that's Air Force interesting. Ooh, I carry a gun and I can do <laughs> infantry stuff. Yes. So, what are you doing? I'm guarding a freaking airplane. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I graduated just before Christmas in 1977. Then my, my first base was um, in January of 1978. I went to Bitburg Air Base in Germany back when it was called West Germany. Yeah. And it was a fun location because um, we were it was overmanned. They had just gotten rid of their nuclear capability, and it was just an F-15 base. And it was probably a year after the F-15s had landed at that base, and it was an air superiority fighter. It was not. It was not the ground attack mode, right? And it was a fun place. I mean, everybody was so proud of the F-15. But being over man, you know, where are you going to put these alcoholic athletes? <laughs> right. and that's when I started hitting the gym. And that's when I started growing physically. Um, yeah, so I, I went from five feet 10 to six feet one at that time. I really? um, started packing on oh. weight. And so, you know, being an 18, 19 year old kid, you know, first thing I got turned on to beer um, and wine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't miss those two things. And right. that's when I met uh, probably my first best friend in the world, a kid named Mike Mears. Um, he and I, you know, he was from California. I was raised in Pennsylvania. Everything else was identical. Um, my dad, primary, you know, my dad's job was he was a line. I was a he was a lineman. Um, his dad was a was a lineman. Wow. My mom worked for the school district. His mom worked at the school district. I had a big family. He had a big family. Um, his my parents were Catholic. His parents were Catholic. Yes. Yeah. Other than that, yeah, we were matched up. We yeah. became roommates. Um, so, you know, we had a lot in common. So, you know, and we were both roommates. It was just one of those, you know, one of those guidings in life that, you know, you can't find anything tighter. You know, right, it's right. just serendipity, for lack of a better term. Sure. And we became close. I was a little bit more of an introvert. Being a California kid, everything was big. You know, so, you know, he would drag you on being like, what are you, he's going like, what are you doing this week? You know, our three days, we worked a great shift. We worked three mids, uh, I'm sorry, three swing shifts, 24 hours off, three midnight shifts, and then three days off. Nice. Um, so on our three days off, you know, he'd have something planned. And so it was, you know, whether it was, it was, it was um, going out and just visiting the economy, um, in the in the um, spring or the summer, they'd have the Germans would have a wine fest. Mm. You know, every place would be celebrating. We'd go to those, and of course, in the fall, you have Oktoberfest. Yeah. Every place would be celebrating their beers, so we would do that. So in the summertime, um, I'd usually hit the weights, uh, go you know begin my boxing career. I'd go to the gym and just start learning boxing with the boxing team. Mm-hmm. Did not get on the boxing team, just learn how to box bear. Um, And, and like it start packing pounds on correctly, um, turning a little bit more into muscle. And at at Bitburg, of course, they started asking for volunteers. Oh, I'll volunteer. (laughs) And they wanted every flight wanted to build what they called a tactical neutralization team. That was, that was just a great team, great term for like a SWAT team. Okay. Um, (laughs) It was, and, and, there was no training. You know, they just took four of us and a team leader and they, they ran us in circles. Okay. First thing in the morning, we're just going to run a couple of miles full gear. Um, and then we'd sit around and somebody read out of a book and <laughs> it was so dry. Yeah. And, and most of the time I'd be five minutes into it. I'd be, 
And so they went around saying there's more there's more security policemen with secret and top secret clearances than they than they need. And so they started, you know, mandatorily moving security police um, over to to replace all these cops that got fired. Okay. And they did it quickly. And so that's and fortunately, my, my buddy Mike and I got assigned, you know, pulled at the same time. And when they pulled us, they say everything you want goes. <laughs> I had I had bought a couch from a guy that that, that PCS um back to the States before this. And it was a cheap ass couch, but it was long. So by that time I'm now six, two and it fit me to a T. It was actually bigger than the, than the old military bunks. Oh, and nice. by, by the time I'm six, two, my feet are hanging off the end. All right. And so I'm like, Ooh, I'm taking my couch. We threw it on the back of a ton and a half truck. I actually slept in the couch in the back of the ton and a half <laughs> as we drove the, as we drove the uh, 50 kilometers to get there. Threw it in the, threw it in the, um, you know, that's I'm carrying it up the stairs. The squadron commander's doing, yeah, what? <laughs> they said, it's a PCS assignment. I can carry it with me. Um, right. Threw it into my barracks room, threw shit out of the barracks room, um, <laughs> put my bed in. And of course, Mike's in the same room and we're on the same flight. <laughs> and of course, they're trying to assign me to a different room. And I go, no, I want to be with my roommate. Yeah. They go, you know, familiarity bring, breeds contempt. <laughs> Mike and I are looking at him going, screw off um, right. <laughs> and we back to the same thing yeah three mids i'm sorry three swings three mids three days off and nothing changed yes yeah, so, but i'm hitting the weights more um and so i'm we're there um we're there and then january comes i get or december comes and i get orders to go to okinawa um mike goes mike actually gets he, he wanted to go with me but they sent him to Loring, Maine, and I I got sent to Okinawa. Mm. And we still came, stayed in touch, of course, doing the, you know, doing the long distance phone calls and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. once I got to um, Okinawa, they were still, you know, doing the in processing. They were, you know, there was, um, they were still trying to figure out what flight. And of course, scuttlebutt through the through the uh, network was was they had SWAT on the things and they were calling it SWAT at the time. Oh, okay. And they were really, you know, they were almost as bad as the TNT teams on Okinawa, except for they were a little more physical and, and they were a little more cliquish. And of course, yeah, I want to be in a SWAT team. Sure. It, it's, it's just, you know, I want to be special too. Um, and so <laughs> I, I heard that Bravo flight was looking for a member because one of them at PCS and they really wanted to build one out. So I embellished. Um, and so the, the, and said, Oh, I was on the tactical neutralization team and I lied a little bit more sure. and I'm, I'm sitting at the NCO club. It's like two or three days before my, which flight I was going to be on. And the flight chief named Wayne Fote met me at the, met me at the NCO club. And so you want to be a, you know, you're on the TNT teams. And what makes you think you're good enough to be on SWAT? <laughs> Well, I've done this, 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 and this, embellishing, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and two days later, I went. I was on his flight. Nice. Like, well, that's a good sign. <laughs> and and I hadn't even been on there a week when all of a sudden, hostage crisis. And <laughs> he grabs me, um, a nice, a great guy named Sonny Valella, and a good guy named uh, Bill Pittman. And we show up. You know, and as we're driving down, I go, "Where are we going?" Just Maki Minato housing sector. There's a hostage crisis. You know, you know, there's a, there's a guy barricaded with a weapon with his wife in the bedroom. I'm like, Ooh, we're getting serious now. Right. And you know, I'm joking it off. And Wayne's looked at me like, you're awful calm for this. Like, yes. Just a hostage hostage thing. I mean, <laughs> if, if the negotiators can't deal with this, you know, you know, SWAT's always the last resort. Right. And we show up and, you know, we, you know, we don't even have weapons. Um, that's what I'm, you know, I'm not worried yeah. <laughs> if, if we're showing up without weapons, you know, of course we're on Okinawa. Nobody's got weapons. Okay. okay? You can't, you know, to have a weapon, it's gotta be locked in the base. Um, oh, so, okay. you know, so I'm not, I'm not worried as, at, at anything. Mm -hmm. And we come in, there's, there's, you know, the Navy has their, their people all the way around. Of course the Navy doesn't have a SWAT team. <laughs> and so I, I back out and I walk around and there's more, Navy cops 
sitting around on the outside. Go, and I just walk around and going, nice day for a hostage crisis, ain't it? And it's just <laughs> looking at me like I'm nuts. And I walk through the front door, you know, there's, there's, and there's um, OSI sitting inside the door. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? We're waiting for our opportunity. And Sonny comes in behind me and Bill's right behind him. I go, oh, to OSI, what weapons is he holding? He goes, he's got a samurai sword. <laughs> what kind of samurai sword is it? Oh, it's the one you get at the PX. And I'm like, he's got one of those fake samurai swords? <laughs> yeah. And they see these nice little bully clubs. Can I have that one? And I hand, and, and, and we steal three of them. Yeah. And, I, and I asked, I asked Sonny, where's, where's Sergeant Folk? He's outside with the hostage commander. And, and I go, let's go. The door's unlocked. And so <laughs> we go in and there's this guy, he's, he's, he's drunk. Yeah. And so we bum rush him. Sonny takes his, his baton, knocks the, knocks the sword out of his hand. I'm, you know, I just bear hug him. Pick him up and sumo slam him onto the bed and Bill's there with the handcuffs. Zip zop. <laughs> and we carry him out. <laughs> it's like, and everybody's looking at him and go, hostage crisis over and dump him on and OSI's on him. Just but, but, can you guys can you guys take him to the to the uh the jail? <laughs> That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> hostage negotiation, you know, hostage crisis over. Thank you. Y'all can go home now. They were probably dug in. They thought they were going to be there all night long. And you guys just yeah. like, yeah, just. Yeah, we just walk in there. I mean, this is, this, yeah, it was one of the funniest thing we did. <laughs> yeah. No medals, no nothing. You know, yeah. we, we didn't get anything out of that except for a piece of paper saying, y'all did good. Um, I think we would have done more if we would have done something spectacular. Okay. Yeah. We are, we are, we're brainless freaking beasts. It's like, <laughs> go in, do something. You know, you know it's, it's yeah there was there was no plan we didn't write out an elaborate plan all right um and at that point um he was a lieutenant at the time the mike michael um michael w reynolds and he he looked around and, and i wrote a great after action report there was a goat rope and i wrote it up that way um <laughs> i did make everybody I tried to sugarcoat it and try to make everybody look a little better than what it was mike read between the lines yeah. And he said, he, he got together. Mike was a graduate. Um, and another guy you'll, I'll, I'll probably mention right later, Mike was a graduate of the Air Force's uh, SWAT team, the, the, the original. And it's, it, it'll be in one of the training records that I actually graduated from. And then Staff Sergeant Rex Green was actually a graduate of the FBI's SWAT team oh, nice. when he was stationed in Virginia. And he and Mike got together. They wrote up a great um training syllabus, sent it into the wing commander and said, this is what went wrong and this is how we can fix it. Instead of a four-man team, let's build an eight-man team for the whole wing. This way, when you call out, um, we can send in four, six, and eight, right. um, depending on the size. And once we get so many set up, we can build from that and build another team on base because we'll actually get train the trainer slots right right and that's what that's what mike started doing and the wing bought off on it nice. and since we had an F fbi trained and and um captain mike as a as trainer he built an eight-man slots <laughs> so he said first thing we need to do is tryouts of course me sonny and bill were signed up for the tryouts there were 50 sure. of us that tried out and it was a simple simple test one was a hundred yard dash um Two mile run, push up, sit ups, um, and actually climbing a a ten foot wall with a with an outhang out, outhang. So you had to hit the wall, um, grab up, pull yourself up, uh, basically doing a muscle up, roll across the top of the wall, come down, and then you had a a two hundred pound dummy, dead weight dummy that you had to drag a hundred yards. Yeah. And <laughs> by that time now I'm six three and, and pushing two hundred. And I'm then I'm benching I'm I'm benching a Cadillac, right? Um, then still and still running and still running six miles a day at a good pace. Mm -hmm. and, you know, why? Because my Mike my buddy Mike wasn't there to get me drunk all the time. Right. So, <laughs> so I'm nothing else to do. Nothing else but an athletic alcohol you know alcoholic can do. So right. let's hit let's hit the bench and start running. Um, and so yeah, I, I'm blowing. I blew through this thing like crazy, and. 
and Mike goes, okay, final test. You know, we had, we had, we had these seven men that he wanted. He was going to be number eight. Mm-hmm. Um, he goes, okay, now's the, now's the test for tenacity. And he goes in this elephant grass and the elephant grass, one, it, it's not quite bamboo thick. You know, it's a little bit lighter. It, I want to say it's, it's probably a quarter of an inch thick. Yeah. Um, somewhere in this elephant grass, there is a there is a body. There's a human in there, and you have to find him and bring him back to me. And so, yeah. And everybody looks. Anybody worked point before? I go. I love point man duty. Mm-hmm. And you know, he gives us the long. Um, the riot control sticks. It's okay. long popsicle sticks, about a little over a little over a meter long. And he says, "These are your guns." <laughs> so if you see him and, he, and you go bang bang, <laughs> I'm like, <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> and so we were thinking, okay, he's got one like this. So you know, but he did. He Mike doesn't give us any any warning. And so you know, we come around, we see the elephant grass. Knowing that, you know, if, if wherever the elephant grass is bent, that's where he's going because you just can't, you know, you don't go into this place. Right. You know, it's like chasing deer through, through thick foliage, mm-hmm. you know, get, you know, the deer trail. So I'm running point and I see well beaten path. So I'm following the path. And as I'm going through the path, um, you know, mine clicks going, wait a minute, there's a, there's a path that just cut back right behind me instead of a well beaten path. And right when I, you know, and right when I turn, I see, I see movement. It's just one of those corner vision eyes. I spin around and there's this little guy comes to my shoulder. He's kneeled down and it's, it's basically surprise. And I lunge. He wasn't expecting me to lunge. No more people don't do that. Sure. Um, and he, and he hip shots in, with a 38, you know, the same, you know, same 38 you saw in the early air force and fires off a blank. I didn't know it was a blank and he didn't expect me to, charging and i catch the powder shot right in the head oh no um, oh yeah beautiful shot Whoa. and his eyes wake up and he really and he takes off running right down that strain path and you know the the other seven members of the team or now six members of the team are running after him going bang 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 and i'm going god there better not be blood <laughs> i'm like that son of a bitch i leave my pole there and i come out with a gerber mark ii um fighting knife and I'm pissed. I am so upset. Um, and I call my Gerber, Gerber Mark II Mr. Stabby. <laughs> so now I've got Mr. Stabby in, a, in an underhand Warang Do style fighting position. And I'm, I'm kicking in full speed. I got afterburners. Um, Joe DePeter was the last one in line. I grab him by the, his, his, his shirt and I'm throwing him out of the way. And, and I'm running, I'm catching everybody. They're going bang, bang, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> And I'm now catching up on this on this gentleman, and he sees me behind him. I'm I'm, you know, and he starts kicking in afterburners. Once he takes off, I'm now kicking into afterburners. I mean, he's dodging through through uh, three tier canopy jungle that's on it's in the um, weapon storage area on Okinawa, and he is he is he is flat afterburners, and I'm on him like white on rice. I you know he's ten yards ahead of me, and I can't gain on him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's, you know, I find out later he's a PJ. Yeah, those guys are, those guys are trained for long, long distance running. I'm a long distance running, but I just can't. And finally he finds a way to come back onto the road to where the, where the evaluators on. And you now he's screaming at the top of his lungs. Somebody get this, this gorilla off of me. <laughs> and I still have bloodlust in my eyes. Sure. And I hear, I hear Captain Reynolds yell, Hosey, don't kill him. I need him. <laughs> and I'm puffing. I'm puffing. Wayne's hiding behind him. Soon to know later, it's it's, it's Wayne is hiding behind him, just <laughs> hiding, going, "Don't kill me! Don't kill me! Don't kill me!" I I stand up and and again I hear Sergeant Hosey, lock your heels, put the knife away, <laughs> and Wayne comes. He goes, "You know, Sergeant Hosey, you good?" I'm good. You bleeding? No, Captain. He goes, okay, you guys can make friends. And Wayne comes up, shakes his hand, and goes, I'm Sergeant Wayne Walls. Can I buy you a beer? Ooh, beer? <laughs> we, and you know, after, after you know, we're at the NCO club, and after we're both snot-licking drunk, you know, we became best friends. Mike, Mike was instrumental to getting 
a lot of training done in that short period of time. Um, we went through, um, you know, he, he got the wing convinced that because of, you know, we were dealing with hostage situations that, and most of the bases um, built around the, the jungles that were on Okinawa. Mm-hmm. And so he, he wrote up a scenario where it made it feasible that if, if there was a hostage situation and we were the quick reaction force, if there was a terrorist attack on the base and there actually were at some time, um, you know, we were worried about the Red Army faction at that time, um, that if, if they did a hit and they got trapped inside on the base, they would they would go hide out in these areas in the jungle. Mm-hmm. So it would be feasible that you send in um, the emergency services team to root them out of the jungle. It would be good if we were trained in jungle operations. All right. So and the best place to do it was at the Marine Corps um, jungle warfare training area, the northern training area. So the wing bought off of it, and we went and we got a slot to go to the northern training area. Nice. What was fortunate for us was as we the, the slot that we got was right when the Marine Corps was training two squads to go to the go to Hawaii for their super squad competition. Mm. Um, a very prestigious um, training, you know, very prestigious competition, um, kind of like our lightning challenge. Okay. Um, and uh, except for it, it was a squad level exercise. And I mean, they, it is, everything has to be done by the book, step one, step two. Um, it involves, um, you know, repelling. It revolves squad, you know, squad tactics, um, ambushes, um, one of the big things is it is an infiltration course. They have a path they have to go through. It's heavily booby trapped. Yeah. Um, it is um, and at the you know, once you get through the booby traps, you have to do a sentry stock where you have they have a live human with a fake rifle. The killer has to come up, take the sentry out, assume the sentry's position, um, and they have to do it silently, and then two other people have to drag the now deceased body um Hmm. away and your whole squad has to go through without being caught and you're observed by um by your observers have night vision goggles and scopes um if there's any noise made by the by the person who's being taken out whether it's an oomph or a body hitting the ground or if he actually hears you or sees you coming he's supposed to make an alarm um and you know i have to say about these super squads you know, they are highly trained, highly skilled. I'm not going to put them down. Mm-hmm. But to train for this, they had probably been to the NTA a dozen times or more in, in probably six to eight months. You okay. know, they know that land like the back of their hand. They probably got a little lax. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like it, it's like going to the playground a hundred times playing tag. Yeah. You know, you know every nook and cranny. They probably got, they probably, you know, they probably went through the motions. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was the first time for us. And so we did it by the book 100% of the time. Yeah. Uh, the, um, and so, yeah, we weren't going to make a mistake and we didn't. Um, the, when we, when we went through that, that, that patrol lane, you know, I was point, I found every, every portion, the guys that slid behind me, it was well marked. You know, we knew exactly what we were doing and they didn't make a, a, a point. I took out the sentry so quick and so hard <laughs> when he dumped. I was it. Yeah, it was just perfect. He dumped. I rolled, picked up his weapon, put his hat on and took over the patrol so quick that the guys with the night vision scopes didn't even see, you know, just thought he knelt, knelt down really? and, and <laughs> back up. Yeah, that's it was that quick. The, the two guys uh, that picked him up, drug him away in the prone position oh, and man. the entire squad prone position their way through. They, they actually, the, the observers thought we didn't even make it through. They thought we didn't make the time frame. Oh, really? The, the, awesome. the, the observer that was with us is actually the one that, that confronted said, no, I was with them the whole way. Yeah, we, we made it through under the time frame. Wow. So it was, yeah, it was I actually handed the AK-47 to the instructors to prove the point. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? Um, 
That's awesome. We went through, we, uh, we wanted to learn how to repel properly and do one of the Marine Corps' most exciting things, and that was called SPY, which is Special Patrol Insertion Extraction. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is you, you, when, a, when a patrol is in a very small area where a helicopter la- can't land, you drop down a very thick rope with a weight on the end of it. And the, the units put on a, a sling rope, wrap around a sling rope, the old style um, harnesses you know, that you tie around your waist, mm. and the team clips in. As the helicopter covers comes to ground, they clip into this rope and the helicopter comes straight up. It just lifts the whole team straight up and it flies out. And you're hanging like Superman. Two, two men teams. You have one one right beside you. You can hang up to 16 men, depending on the size of the helicopter, straight down and straight out, and, and, and it hangs up underneath you. Mm-hmm. Um, the only people that teach and and the, what they call Repel Master and Spy Master courses is 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marine Recon. On At that time, they were scheduled on Ona Point. And the most interesting part about Ona Point was if you look up the history of 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marine third marine recon on ona point um there's a great history from world war ii through vietnam when they got stationed on ona point and then there's the entire history of ona point and then you have from when they got stationed at camp Swab. you they can give you a bloody great in-depth detail of everybody from world war ii until they got to ona point yeah. and then after ona point they have everything what they did up up through um global war on terror Wow. That small history on Ona Point says they were on Ona Point. That's it. That's it. <laughs> he said, and then they were in mission. That's it. I mean, that that wow. whole thing is so dark. Yeah. yeah. It kind of sounds like that that group that's not stationed on in at uh, Camp McCall. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but I remember certain names and, and uh, we were trained in, in on Repel Master and Spy Master by by two guys that, um, you know, you can find them, you can find them in the Navy cross, um, history. One of them, one of them from 1967 to, yeah, when he was at a four in one month period of time, received a silver star and a Navy cross Wow. In, on two separate actions. Jeez. Um, a year later leading a, um, as a Sergeant leading a 150 man team, received the, as, a, as an E5, received the Distinguished Service Cross from the Army. That was the kind of training, you know, guys that were training us. And, wow. you know, great, great guys. And, yeah, they were they were great people. Um, and still why on Okinawa, you know, you know and, and, of course, being with, and, and being with, you know, at the time, Staff Sergeant Walls, um, you know, we, we made great deals with the, with the PJs. And going through the emergency services training, we asked for Wayne specifically. Um, like I said, when when uh, Mike Reynolds said, Sergeant Hosey, I need him because we put him through our emergency services training. Um, he was our, he, we unofficially classified him as our team medic. Oh, okay. And so whenever he wasn't on missions, we would, you know, we would ask for him by name to come on their stuff. And yeah, he put, he put more stitches in me at, on one, yeah, on on one one it was we I, I listed it down as NTA number two. When we embarrassed the uh, the Marine Super Squads, we were asked to invited to come back um, to to because we 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 dishonored the Marine Corps Super Squads by beating them beating the Marines at their game. Right. We didn't intend it. I'll be honest, sure. we didn't intend it. It just happened. Yeah. Um. So the. Third Marine Division contacted our wing and invited us to come back um, to to meet with a hand select group um, to to learn more about Marine yeah. Corps tactics. Yeah, and oh gosh, we did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, they weren't vindictive, okay, yeah. um, but they wanted to they wanted to teach us what they really did, and so they you know we had three days of refamiliarization. And I mean, we were taught really well. Mm-hmm. I will not lie about that. You know, you know, you know, this is, remember, this is a, this is a SMEAC patrol order, you know, situation, mission, action. 
um, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, get back to your land navigation in the jungle, um, your survival skills in the jungle. And then we were given um, eight hours to, to, to do our warning. You know, we got a warning order, then we got a preparation order and, and write it up. We were given three hours to sleep. Um, and, and that was one of the fun things that on that one, during that three hours we were having, it was probably 95 degrees and we were and with, with 150% humidity. Um, and, and that night we, we, we went to, we went to get some sack time at one o'clock in the morning and Okinawa had a, somehow had a cold snap and it dropped down to 40 degrees. Oh my gosh. You know, and of course when you're used to hundred degree heat, you know, 40 degrees is flipping freezing. Oh yeah. And yeah. And listening to Wayne, um, you know, he said of everything you do, had a, had the old style LBE harnesses and I carried a butt pack, which everybody said, butt packs are stupid. You know, I carried in my butt pack, you know, extra, extra, um, blank ammunition that I taped down so it wouldn't shake. But also at the very bottom, I had a half a wool blanket. Nice. You know, don't carry a full one, go to half. And I'm sitting here with the wool blanket and, and I see, I see one of my tight friends there and I go, Hey, I have a half a wool blanket. You know, I can be somewhat comfortable in a wool blanket or I can share this half a wool blanket with a button, other buddy, and we could be warm and get some sleep. <laughs> and, and it took him, a, took him about two seconds and go, say, yeah. oh, I'm in. And we wrap that, we wrap it around ourselves. And, um, yeah, of course you hear all the, all the detriment com comments in there about, about two gay men sleeping together. Right. And you know, at, the, at the time, I mean, we were, we were butt to butt, you know, and, and, and everybody's making the comments about 30 minutes in, you know, we are nose to, you know, we, we're like a couple of girls you know, and we hear guys coming in, you got enough room for another one. Right. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, three hours, you know, three hours in, wake up guys. I roll that blanket up. We're stuffed in and we hit the wire to go out the door. Um, nice. Object was, you know, we were given, you know, we, we were given basically infiltrate, hit a base camp, um, do an ambush and in, you know, exfiltrate out. Mm. Um, you know, five days, you know, I think I probably got two 30 minute naps. Goodness. And yeah, that was that was that was the longest days of my life. Yeah, because yeah, we were we were running gun battles, trying to sneak. And I said Wayne Wayne was with us. And and when I say I fell off a cliff, um, it was not you know it's not like I you know just like woo there it was. Um, Okinawa is is in that portion of the NTA is three tier canopy jungle mm -hmm. and. Are, if, are you familiar with three tier? Oh yeah, I just yeah. Of pain them all, so. Okay, yeah. Nobody ever told me that three tier canopy jungle also extends to what you're walking on. Yeah, you know the root system, and I was not aware of that. So right. and so with that three tier canopy jungle, I'm carrying a a cut down GAU five, you know, mm -hmm. an M16, and we had gone to the armory, and they cut it down to where it's this big on me. Mm -hmm. the joys of being a point, a point man. Right. And so, I'm, I mean, I'm stacked up. I've got um, two 30 round mag pouches on each side of me, two canteens. I've got slap flares and, and ground burst simulators in both my cargo pockets. Mm -hmm. I've got, um, I'm mounted with, with uh, um, smoke canisters all over the place. All right, all right. And it is so dark. I mean, we have, we have cat, cat eyes, on the back of our collars. It is so dark, you can't see the cat eyes. Yeah. And so we're running our patrol and the guy in front, Don, Don Vigil, um, was, was behind me. He carried a shotgun and he has it over my shoulder. And, you know, I'm, and the, the rec screen is the, is a navigator and he can barely see the compass. All right. And, and all he has is written down is it, he's got it memorized is, is the azimuth. And I mean, he's just following the azimuth like this with his hand, everybody's hand to hand on it. And, and, and Rex goes, there's a stream should be on top of it. And he's, he's whispering to Don, Don's whispering to me. And 
I'm stepping forward and I'm like, okay, we're going downhill. I think we're almost there. I take another step. We're definitely going downhill. And the next thing you know, I go, whoop. <laughs> that going downhills, I'm already on top of the root system. And I'm going downhill because I'm on the root system. And just like Bugs Bunny and, and Elmer Fudd, you know, Elmer Fudd's walking out over the edge of a cliff. And <laughs> I right through the right oh, through the canopy <laughs> the the only thing that slowed me down was there was a little rock outcropping that's all they hear was Oof, and then splash <laughs> like, oh, you the creek <laughs> <laughs> and, and i mean okay let's find hosey <laughs> son of a bitch wants to climb down <laughs> so they 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 set up they set up a quick you know they they did a quick um um, you know, they basically, they wrapped a rope around a tree and, and did a double rope repel down to me. By the time they got to me, you know, I'm neat. Now I'm, I'm sitting up in the water. Um, you know, just, just, but everything that rope that, that when I went through the root, root system, it ripped both camel pockets out. So I'm, I'm no longer have the, the, uh, simulators. I no longer have the slap flares. My LBE was up around my my armpits, but yeah. I don't realize this because yeah. you know, when they get to me, they're pulling my stuff down, um, you know, getting me back together, and everybody's around me, and and they, they go, "Let's get going." <laughs> I'm, I don't know this. <laughs> we get back in line, and um, it's like 250 meters later, we're we're, we're at the night pause position. We're, we're gathered, gathered on our tight three sixties as, as only an eight man team can do. And, and I don't know how long it was later. Mike grab, gathers me and, and, and a guy named Joe DePeter, he was the radio man and goes, okay, let's go do our, let's go do our, our leaders recon. I'm like, okay, where are we? <laughs> you led us here. <laughs> Last thing I remember was going downhill. He goes up, Wayne, check on Hosey. And Big brings out a light. How many fingers am I holding up? I can't see them. Oh he goes, yeah. he's got a concussion, Mike. He's like, we need to medevac him. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We, we got a mission to do. I'm not going to stop this one. We're winning. Right. <laughs> yeah, so we completed the mission. You know, and, and that was when we were doing the, uh, that's right before we did the, the, uh, the base camp attack. And that was a fun one. Um, <laughs> we, we had set up the M60, um, right at the top of the, right at, we had the, we, they were down in a hole. We had the M60 set up perfectly, um, to, to provide, um, grazing and, and enfilade fire. <laughs> and, and a guy named Scott Claire had the 60 set up. He had his, had his assistant gunner right beside him. And Mike initiated the, the, the fire with, with his, with his AR-15 and Scott goes, bop, 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 and the weapon jams. Oh man. And the Marines get up and start laughing at him. He grabs his slap flare and goes, <laughs> <laughs> fires a slap flare directly at the Marines that were laughing at him <laughs> and then clears the jam. <laughs> we, we successfully swept through the camp and then the M60 finally got back online, oh, nice. grabbed the Intel grabbed and ran um the marines were like you guys are flipping nuts um and and on the ambush you know we you know we got out got our stuff um and running gunfight for probably like the next eight hours they backed up backed off we got into we got into a uh um another um area set up you know traveled again for about another mile set up an orp then moved to our ambush position again it was oh dark 30 um, we were probably 10 yards off the, off the, we were in a, we were in a good defilade position, set up a, set up an L shaped ambush. And we all set up two ground burst simulators a piece on you know, right beside us. And it, it was not recon that was, that was coming down the road. It was six evaluators. They just wanted to see, you know, if we did the, if we did the ambush correctly oh, Okay. and we heard them coming and, you know, initiated the ambush with the, with an AR-15, and for some reason, other than other than the M60, 
it wasn't planned. We all stopped firing and started, and we all tossed. They were, they were the artillery simulators, yeah, yeah. the ones that whistled first and then blew up. All right. We all stopped firing, and all of us threw both artillery simulators at the same time. And you could hear, hear the the uh, instructors start giggling. Ah, we got you now, Air Force. And right at that time, <laughs> all ten of them, nice. and they're like, "Oh." It. Boom, 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 boom. And they take off running down the path to the point where the where the uh, um, the evaluator was with us walks in the middle path going, get back here, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> and we hear F you. Those Air Force guys are nuts. Right. And so we never got the chance to fleet for bodies and get their intel. Yeah. <laughs> so we backed off, went to another night pause position, and those are the pictures I sent you okay. because we are flipping exhausted. I should have sent you the one of Staff Sergeant Green. He is, I mean, he's leaning up against a tree stump, weapon like this, and 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 he is out. Definitely. He is dead out. <laughs> um, and the one picture, I went up, snuck up, because I carried that Minolta camera I had was just perfect. I, yeah. I bought it at the base exchange. It was, it was as long and as thick as an as an uh, thirty round magazine, and it fit perfectly in in right next to my thirty round mags, nice. and it was one of the best things I ever had. Sure, um, yeah. So I would get up and just start snapping pictures through the uh, through the things, and right when I was snapping Mike's picture, um, an artillery simulator went off, and so oh. that's why his face is blurred because right when that thing went off, his head spun. Oh, <laughs> so okay. it, um, the uh, yeah. So again, another running gun fight, um, and then we, you yeah, know, that that was that, and we knew that was our last one. So it was, it was, we infiltrated our wire without getting under fire because we were able to to run run away from them and and lose them. Nice. We infiltrated, and then we had the debrief, which was, you know, the the and we had we were also fighting. We were fighting the cadre and a small squad, probably a six man squad of Marine Recon. Um, and when we infiltrated, debriefed. Um, took a quick took a quick bath out of the out of the old water buffaloes that the Marines had. We had a the chow hall at the N NTA was opened up for all of us, and it was just a great you know just a great gathering. And they they all said the same thing. Now this is what the Marines do in the jungle, and you know so yeah, there was no animosity, no nothing. But they showed us you know just because we we beat them on this doesn't mean we're yeah you know, doesn't mean we can beat the Marines on their home turf. Sure, sure. Yeah, so it was yeah, yeah, well, good time. So, yeah. yeah, at that at that time and place, that was at that before I got into attack. Be that was probably the greatest two years of my life. Yeah. Um, after that, it was um, you know I got orders to Little Rock airplane patch to the missile silos. Mm. Um, yeah, that was that was that was not a good location. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was, Going to the Strategic Air Command after being after running Freedom um, in the in the normal Air Force was was completely different. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but again, that term of we need volunteers again, following my dad's advice, hand went up. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the the security police had, and I don't know if they still do it, have have an annual competition called the Peacekeeper Challenge. Each major command sent a a twelve man unit to Kirtland airplane patch for, um, for an, uh, you know, for a competition combining physical shooting and a few other, few other things to, mm -hmm. um, find out who's, who's has the best security policeman in, okay. in the major command. And of course, raise my hand. We sent, we sent, um, six from my unit and we had a gathering, at Pete Field, Peterson Air Force Base, when it was a small location, it was before um, it was Base Command, um, and and uh, we started training. And of course, still in shape, still you know. And so they did that. They did it at Pete Field because it was a higher elevation than what Kirtland Air Force Base was. Oh, okay. And so it was, and and so we we got down to we got down to the teams we need. We show up. Um, with the, we show up at the the competition. Like I said, there's there's chances for eleven gold medals, um, and and we we walk away with nine of them. Nice. And the 
And of course, we when we get done with that competition, in you know the street, the, the sack had never even received one gold medal until that until oh, really? that day. So <laughs> nice. from the from from the you know from the SAC commander, four star general at the SAC commander, all the way down to all the way down to my squadron commander, everyone with a star down to a, down to my commander who was a, at that time a lieutenant colonel. Um, in that chain of command, I got a letter of appreciation from, oh, nice. and everybody said, "If you ever need anything, just call me." I was at the end of my six year stint at that time, and and I go, "Okay, I do not want to stay in SAC. Um, I need a way out." And I came up and said, "You know, came up to training and said, I get my guarantee cross training. I go, it's time for me to move on." And at that time, I'm you know, I I had. I've been known to be a little bit of a procrastinator at that time. Mm-hmm. And they said, you have three months left. Uh, I go, what do you want to be? And I go, I want to be a PJ. And they looked and said, you don't have enough time. Okay. It takes six months for us to submit the paperwork for you to do the test and, and to get time. And I go, what's my other options? And they go, well, here's your other options. And I'm going through going, <sighs> And I'm, and I'm reading through and I go, and I, I see this group called Tactical Air Command and Control Specialist. I'm like, eh, ooh, parachuting. <laughs> you can be a parachutist. So that's the only thing I knew about it. Yeah. About a month later, I got a, I got a call from the uh, um, training offices and, and um, from cross training saying, this is amazing. Your school date is, is, <laughs> is September <laughs> of... 1983. I showed up in September and, and yeah, it was, it was, you know, a month later was, it was October was Grenada. And so, yeah, that was when I'm sitting there going, damn, I wish I'd have came in here six months earlier. All right. Yeah. You know, school physical wise. Um, I want to say it was, it was other than day one, <laughs> it <right>. was <laughs> first day of PT. Um, yeah, because everybody, uh, I don't want to put the staff down. Day one was a bear. Mm. Um, yeah, because day one of PT, I don't care who you are, you get smoked. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I, you know, they looked at me and go, he's here as a staff sergeant. He took away a staff sergeant slot, which took away a sergeant slot, that took away a senior airman slot, that took away, yeah, all the way down the line. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I had a, I had a target on me for that. So they yeah they they smoked me, um, and but everything else with the exception of radios because I knew other than the, the PRC seventy seven, I knew nothing of radios. Um, so other than that, everything else was 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 fairly easy. You know the POW SEER training was easy. Mm-hmm. You know I had gone through similar training with the Marines. I had gone through similar training for other stuff. So, but yeah, the school was great. I mean, you know, we, those of us that volunteered for airborne got the, the extra airborne training. Mm. Um, when the, the, the ones that I got to go back through was, um, they went to airborne was Brad Kephart and Kelly McKenzie. Um, I never knew what happened to, to Kelly after I left Bragg, but, uh, Brad, I understand went on to do a fat, fantastic career in the career field. Um, really good, really hard charger. Yeah. Um, Kelly was also very good, very hard charger while we were at Bragg. Um, so, yeah, I mean, great, great group of guys, great, hard, motivated guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't even, you know, of course, of course, I've had six traumatic brain injuries recorded. So sometimes it's hard to remember sure. you know, a lot of things in those time frames. Um, but Kelly, Brad, and I graduated uh, airborne school in March of 84 and we got assigned to Fort Bragg. Um, my, you know, I get there, Bragg was, uh, um, I got assigned to third brigade, 82nd airborne division as the, as the NCOIC of it. And, and that got changed to the 505th parachute infantry regiment, but I had the greatest group of guys and they rotated in and out. But I mean, it was, uh, I, I couldn't ask. I had the, I had the greatest poker hand, that you could imagine, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know, like I said, some of the, some of the notes that I had on there, I had guys like Buddy Mack, um, Sean Casey, who went on to be a, a PJ, 
I had uh, Dwayne Fisher, um, who was probably the second ranger that came that, that graduated, sec, second uh, ranger at Fort Bragg. Okay. He went on to be a PJ. Um, eventually, I got a hold of Mark Valella, and you know, <laughs> everybody knows about Mark. Yeah. Um, a, a great guy named Paul Stercy. Um, Paul was probably the quiet one in the group. Um, you know, two, seven, five extraordinaire. Yeah. I mean, he was quiet, but yeah, you know, <laughs> good. And then, then a, you know, young senior airman named, um, Artie Denier. Artie, we got from, from, uh, the 21st task, but highly knowledgeable. Again, a nice, quiet guy, but all those guys, you know, he would, they were the easiest men to supervise. Everybody looks and going, you had both Buddy and Valella? Man, how much trouble they get into? I go, none. Yeah. I mean, absolutely none. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, you just, I mean, you just point and say, "I need this done," and then you got out of their way. Yeah, it got done. Um, you know, there was no, there was nothing. I mean, they never got into trouble when I was supervising, mm -hmm. and any minor thing that made it happen, I mean, nobody, nobody mentioned it. Right. I mean, there, the, you know, the reports I got back from whatever, whatever squad, um, group or whatever, you know, unit they were assigned to was nothing but praise. Mm. And it was, yeah. I mean, they kept up, they ran, they ran their units into the ground. Yeah. Um, those guys are the solid. same thing with Paul and, and fish, <laughs> you know, you know, these guys, you know, fish was, was already a ranger tab, um, senior airman, you know, so he would run his guys into the ground and they looked at him and go, and they'd look at him going, you're a senior airman and you got a ranger tab. You're an air force ranger. Right. And he goes, damn right. And he'd pull out his orders. You know, their eyes would get this big. It's like, you know, and they would, they would start asking questions. What do you think we need to do air force? <laughs> and he would lead patrol. Sure. Sure. You know, great guy. Yeah. Um, you know, this is now, now let me tell you a story. I, 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 you know, I still have to apologize to buddy for this. He's, I know he's already forgiven me, but, um, <laughs> My supervisor was was Joe Wax. Now Joe was as hard a man as you can make, um, and Joe had to fight to stay in the TACP. He was a he was a um, he was actually combat control, um, and he gave up. He, he they were going to put him back in the teams um, when the TACP career field changed in 1977, and he said, "No, I want to stay with the TACP teams." Um, and he's one of many. You'll, and I gave you the, the list for Howard O. McNeil. Yeah. Um, Howard O. was the same way. Both of these guys gave up promotions to stay with the TACP. Wow. You know, Joe was a, was a master sergeant, and he retired as a master sergeant mm. um, and because he stayed with the TACP. Joe was a very strict. This is how you have to do things. He was so proud of being airborne to a fault. Yeah. You know, if you weren't airborne, then there was something wrong with you. <laughs> if it was his choice, everybody would be airborne. But if you, you know, and then you go to conventional units. Sure, but sure. He, he believed everybody should have had at least um, an airborne um, he set of wings on your, on your shirt. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as you were going through the, the unit, you had to go through, in Joe's mind, you had to go through every school. And, you know, Ricondo school was the first thing that came to mind. And Joe came up one day because everybody at Fort Bragg had already been to Ricondo school at least once. Right. Um, and, and he comes up to me and he's screaming at me. He's come one day, he goes, we're turning down Ricondo school slots. I want somebody, the next person, next time we get a Ricondo school slot, I want you to send somebody through it. No ifs, ands, or buts. And I'm looking around the unit and, 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 uh, yeah, she's like, I've arranged your tab and I've been through condo school twice. Don't even ask me to go ahead. Right. <laughs> okay. And right at that time, Airman First Class Buddy MacArthur walks <laughs> through my cage. He goes, hi, I'm Airman First Class Buddy MacArthur. Um, I just showed up and I'm assigned to your unit. Um, I'm assigned to your, your brigade. I go, really? <laughs> he goes, I go, do you want to go to Ricondo school? He goes, I'd love to go to Ricondo school. Okay. And I go, fish, Paul. I go get him a set of get him get him issued out his uh, his all his um, material from from Bum Phillips who was in charge of the um, um, supply and I go get him tested. 
<laughs> so they get him stuff, throw him, throw all his gear into one of their rooms. And they they walk him down to re, to the Ricondo School test off Fort, Fort Bragg, and off he goes to Ricondo School. About a week later, um, Joe Walks comes up. He goes, "Have has has Airman First Class MacArthur showed up yet?" Yes, yes, uh, Sergeant Walks. Where the hell is he? Well, he's in his first week week of, of uh, three week Ricondo school. <laughs> he hasn't even checked into the base yet. <laughs> well, you told me to send the first person I had available to Ricondo school, Sergeant Walks. <laughs> his head gets this big, bright red, and he wants to kill me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, he. Chief Fiscus, who also just recently passed away, yeah. um, go flying down to Ricondo School and meet up with the um, master sergeant who's in charge of Ricondo School. And he goes, let me talk with, with uh, um, Airman First Class MacArthur and, and find out what he wants to do. But this is my school. If, if, if Senior Airman MacArthur, I mean, Airman First Class MacArthur wants to leave, then he can leave. But if he doesn't want to, there's not a dang thing you can do about it. Right. This is my school. And so he, you know, he goes, talks to, to Buddy, and Buddy basically says, no, I'm not going through this shit again. Right. <laughs> and so he comes back and says, I'm sorry. Aaron MacArthur says he's going to complete this course first. <laughs> Sounds like And him. Chief Fisk is going, I'm going to the, I'm going now. His chief was in time, was at the 82nd Air, Air, um, Airborne Corps. And he goes, I'm going over your head. And he goes, you can try. Yeah. And, so he's, and the core commander says, if this is what, if this is what he says, I'm not going over, you know, I'm not going to pull rank on him. Yeah. And so Buddy graduates for condo school and then he goes through the check-in process. <laughs> then he processes. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Then, then, so, and Joe comes up to me afterwards. I mean, he is, he is still, you know, he is still so hot, he, but he's, He's got his cool under. He goes, from this point on, Sergeant Hosey, <laughs> you will make sure that they check in before you send them to recon to school. <laughs> oh, okay, Sergeant Hosey. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, but Joe walks, you know, he said he, he was hard as nail, but he didn't earn the term Papa Joe because he was hard all the time. He was also, he was also one of these guys where if you had a problem, open door, you could cry on his desk. You can, you know, yeah, um, you could tell him anything you want to know, and he would put an arm on his shoulder and, and help you through his problems. You know, great one of the greatest guys. You know, he would arrange some of the greatest family gatherings. Um, when he passed away, I wish you would have been able to talk to him. He I did too. I did too. There's so many people that talk so highly of him, and I, I, I really I feel like that's a really missed opportunity. I wish I could have had him on. That'd have been great. Yeah, like Larry Fisk is Chief Fisk was another one. Same. There's many before yeah. them. But yeah. You know, we, we hopefully we can carry on the legacy of, of what they have. You know, they these guys were all all pre, you know, all all before us. And like I said, I gave hopefully I gave you a bunch of leads with that for sure. Definitely. Um, yeah, the 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 guys that were just, you know, again, like I keep I can't emphasize enough. We we I walked amongst giants. Yeah. Um. You know, it's just great. Some of the greatest people I've ever known. Yeah. Um. Guys, up other men. The other men I met, I got there right at the right time to know Mitch Monroe. Um, if you ever have an opportunity to get old Mitch, Mitch was the designer of our Flash and Crest. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, he was he was in charge of Stanabel for Debt One at the time, and he um, he was a hoot. Um, <laughs> you know, we we hit it off rather quickly. Yeah. I would love to go back to Brad because he he made he was a fantastic woodworker too. He made a Tack P crest that was probably five feet by five feet. And on the back of it, after you got, if he had anybody that worked on it sanding. Um, and it was a, it was a three dimensional um, crest. So anything, anybody that sanded on it, you flip it over, you signed your name. Oh, okay. And, and then he, 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 and he engraved it with a wood, with a um, wood thing. So I don't, he cared. It was, it was mounted over the training department door, and it was back when they, back when it was on Pope Air Force Base before it became an Air Agos. I don't. I would love to know whatever happened to that. And if you flip it over, you're going to see 
names from from oh, you know, cool ancient see. history written on the back of it. So yeah, I would love cool. to know what what uh, what became of that because if they ever flip it over, you know, there's there's going to be a, a bunch of names from from that time from the 1980s. I wonder where that is. I wonder if it's in the in the uh, 14th ASOS or maybe in the group or something. Or yeah, I'd like to yeah, track that, that would, down. That'd be cool. Be, uh, when, this, when this pops out, maybe somebody can somebody can get an answer to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to hear it. Um, yeah, so. And again, there's a lot of a lot of good guys came out of that unit. Um, you know, I mean, there's so many guys I can mention at Debt One that, that went on to become had great, great career. Um, you know, that went up and, and moved forward. Yeah. Um, because I mean, that was it was just, yeah, they were just fantastic people. And now back to after in um, April of '88, I had an opportunity, and so I went to. The wing is, is in charge of standardization and evaluation. Um, and like I said, the first thing I did, we had we had the list of, there was over a, a thousand questions, you know, that you were supposed to memorize. And 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 then then the standard, you know, wing stand eval would come down and evaluate your unit. And he said, here's your, here's your test of a hundred questions that you're supposed to memorize out of a thousand. And, and, you know, these were, these were based on radios, the, the old PRC forty-seven that you it was a backpackable HF radio. You know, nobody carried those. Even even the reserve and, and national guard units didn't carry those anymore. And so I went through and and wiped them. I wiped five hundred questions out right off the bat. Nice. <laughs> don't use it. Don't use. Don't use. And the DOV, um, sorry, director of operations for Stanabel, um, said, "Why are you doing that?" And I'm like, "Nobody uses them." And he looks and goes. Oh, then wipe out everything that nobody uses. Right. So, good idea. Re- re- yeah. And so I'm automatically cut down 500 questions. Yeah. And 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 no, and those 500 questions weren't. But the other 500 questions we already had in that we were using, including the GRC 206 palette. Mm-hmm. So they, somebody was the, my my predecessor did add questions, but he just didn't delete the de- delete the other questions. Uh, okay. Not putting them down. He just, you know, he was already task saturated with just adding the questions. Sure, sure. Um, I don't know if his boss told him you can't, but my boss was new also. He was a forward thinker. He was he was a he was an A10 driver. Nice. So forward thinking, forward thinking uh, boss. So wipe out. Um, of course, you know, I can only do so much. You know, I had I had seven units, detachments one through seven. All around. Um, don't get me to name which which detachment it w- was which. Right. East Coast, West Coast. Um, so everything everything east of the Mississippi was mine. Um, everything west of the Mississippi was the six L second tactical air con- uh, control wing. Okay. Um, okay. So it was you know so Fort Hood West was 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 it was belongs to everything that was in Arizona. Right. Um, okay. The so. Um, so there were seven units. I only had to visit them once a year. So that I mean that's seven months out of the year. Mm-hmm. So to make things fun for me, um, the the ground training unit, which was at the the NCOIC of that, was Robert Scott, Master Sergeant Robert Scott. Um, you know, one of the you know one of the heroes of Grenada. Yeah, um, you, heard of you him. need to talk to him. Okay. I'd love to. I would love to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's on, yeah, he's online. Get a hold of him. Um, still highly active. Uh, great man. Um, we became close friends and we started looking at the Rangers and debt one. And there's, and then there was second bat and um, each one of us were holding our own jump master training. And, and we're like, and, and what, what was fun was the wing, the wing said, when, when we'd hold our, our jump master training, the wing said, we need somebody to evaluate that. And so they'd send somebody from the 21st task to evaluate the 80 seconds jump master program. And we're like, hold the phone. <laughs> it's like, you have, a, you have a tactical air support squadron that you know, they're supposed to support us if we don't have enough bodies to evaluate whether we're doing our jump master program and a mass tactical jump if we're doing it correctly. You know, these guys don't do mass tactical jumps. All right. And then so I, I brought that with me when I went to the, you know, it, it was a, it, it stuck in my craw. 
And mm-hmm. I go, and so I got with I I got with Scotty and said, "What do you think about if we if the wing we consolidated everything and we we have the trainers, you know, um, Papa Joe walks, um, Jack Hogan, you know, these guys train me. Let's get their knowledge and let's combine it into the wings knowledge and let's use them as trainers. Right. Okay, they can train everybody. We'll consolidate us." And we'll make it the wing jump master program. And and Scott starts chuckling and goes, and we can make it boondoggles. So instead of going to Fort <laughs> right. Bragg, okay, we would do the training in places like Antigua, Bermuda. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and we did it on the wings dime. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and and with me, me being Stanaval, it's like, la, 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 <laughs> you are now. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we had a great time. Oh, uh, man. And, and unfortunately, in 1989, um, Hurricane Hugo hit. And um, it, it, I was on TDY, and um, my then wife um, was, at, at, um, was living at home at Shaw Air Force Base. And um, she, caught the, she caught the back end um, and of the winds and it, she didn't handle it well. And her, her mother died right at the same time. And I, I, you know, she, she packed everything up and moved. So I cleaned everything up and just followed her. Um, I had up, you know, she was living in Albuquerque. I had a job opportunity there. And so I decided that I'm, I'm getting off, off, getting off active duty and I'll figure it out when I get there. Oh. I was offered a job as a, as a sheriff's deputy, and so I just immediately jumped into that position. You know, nice. Law enforcement was was something I could do. Um, you know, with with my firearms training, my my emergency services background, and with some great recommendations. By that time, most of the EST guys that uh, I had served with were already in Albuquerque, um, oh, right and so great recommendations from them. I jumped right into a position. Nice. And while I was there, um, I didn't realize when I was working working as a deputy there, there was another deputy that was that was in the Air National Guard at Kirtland Air Force, Air Force Base. He came up and says, "With all that experience, why throw it away?" Yeah, you know, I work in an Air National Guard there. It's a security police unit. He goes, "You already know the game." And he goes, "Why don't you just come with us?" You know, it's it's. And he goes, "I go well. How often do you guys deploy?" And he starts giggling at me. He goes, the last time this unit deployed, last time this wing deployed was at the Mayaguez incident. Um, the Mayaguez incident was when um, a radar ship, I believe it was off of Cambodia, right after the Vietnam War, um, got captured. Okay. And so that's the last time the wing was deployed. Um, and so, you know, They still have A7s. As the the last unit to carry A sevens, yeah, um, Air Force unit to carry A sevens, um, and so and it goes. Our unit is a forty four man flight. It's a Class C unit. Um, that means they're non deployable. And this was in um, when I it was eighty nine. So this was in like June of nineteen ninety. And I'm like golden, no problem. I'm always so in. skeptical about these big buildups, though. Like there's always it's like. There's no possible way any of this will happen. And, you know, yeah. and then. Yeah. yeah. So in December of 1990, I'm now in Saudi Arabia. Jeez. <laughs> I'm going, oh, my God. What did I just step into? Right. Um, yeah. So and we're, we're on this. We're, we're on this built up base, minding our own business. And an alert sounds. We, there was a terrorist attack. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm on a quick response team. We're just getting on. I'm manning the M60 because I I had gone through M60 specialist school and none of the other group had. So I grab 4,000 rounds of M60 ammo in two crates. I lift incorrectly. Yeah. I hear it pop, but I'm, I'm, I'm running to my, I'm running to my Humvee, my up armored Humvee. And I just throw it in the back, you know, throw the M60 and I'm up and loaded. Let's respond to our location. Mm-hmm. And little did I realize I, I blew out the, the, 
the uh, the back on L4, L5, S1. Oh, and man. yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's once that once that thing's over, the terrorist attack was it was uh, where we were living in our hotel was off off location, and it was not really a terrorist attack. It was the bus companies were having a fight over a contract, and so the the one company that lost the contract um, had a prey and spray on the other company. Oh, really? Yeah, like a drive-by. And it's unfortunate. it was unfortunate. There were a few. Um, there was a you know a couple of couple of Air Force guys on the bus. Nobody was injured. Um, oh. You know, yeah, it's just thank goodness. And drove away. <laughs> but terrorist attack. Uh, so it was the uh, yeah. So yeah, I blew that out for no reason. Man, um, but they sent me. They sent me home. Well, they they sent me to. Uh, um, the, the, the base, the base clinic, they said, we can't handle you here. They sent me home, sent me to Wilford Hall, got surgery, but I had to stay on active duty while, while all my, all, you know, the war, the war was quickly over. I was there for the air, you know, long enough for the air operation. I missed the ground operation because they already flew me home. Um, right. but I had to stay on active duty until, until I healed up. So I didn't get off of active duty until 91, um, December of 91. And by that time, I'd already gone, you know, they'd already replaced me. Um, they'd already filled my job in the sheriff's department. They weren't allowed to, you know, they didn't have to keep it open. Um, and so I started doing um, security contract work for a little Mexican company called Fuego Internacional. And it was, you know, it's not as, it was, it was before it was really cool. Um, yeah. It was site security, personnel security, personal security. Um nothing really major, you know? So yeah. they said, it, it, it just sounds cool, but you know, it brought in money. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. So it's, it's, you know, so when everybody, when I say it, it's contract security, everybody gives, you know, they automatically think triple canopy. They automatically think black, black water. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, so it's it, nothing like that. Okay. Yeah, so it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was minor stuff, but, um, you know, then, then, I had a I had a call from the post office because when I got out, I did all the testing. You know, I wanted to be a U.S. Marshal. One, I, I scored high on all of them, mm-hmm. um, but you know, I was not the kind of people that any anything anybody was looking for. And then one day, I got a phone call from the post office. So going, oh, we have we have all these openings. Are you interested? And I'm like, hell yeah! Right. <laughs> like, um, you know, I started off in Albuquerque as a as a mail carrier, and and then job openings came open in Texas, um, and I'm still in the guard at this time, yeah. air guard at this time. And uh, they had a job opening in Texas, and I took a promotion to go to go to a small town in Texas. And to drive from where I was in Texas to get to the Air National Guard was was almost ten hours. And so I went to the small town there, and it was an it was an Army National Guard unit. It was an engineer unit, and they say we can work with you. You know, you well, you know. We'll, you know, just serve two years with us and, you know, we'll send you to engineering school and we'll, we'll make arrangements with the Air National Guard unit here. You'll play as an, as an, as an army engineer, but you can retire as a tech sergeant. Huh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So they sent me to engineering school. Um, you know, I, they held me as a, as an engineer and, you know, so I finished up my, you know, I did, I did on paper, I did 22 years, but. Um, it was 20 years of good time. Okay. So I got all that out of the way. And then now that I could focus on just one job, which is the post office, I, I could, you know, I started getting back into scuba diving little at a time. Um, but when I got off of, off of, out of the guard, that's when my then wife decided, well, if you're not in the military, I'm not having fun anymore because you're not deploying. Um, you know, you're not bringing in that extra money. She decided game's over. I'm like, Oh, good. Thank you. Um, and so, yeah, nice. you know, so I got into scuba diving and started having more fun. And then I also was focused on the one post office job and started taking bigger promotions came up. Um, then I moved up to a part-time supervisor, full-time supervisor, and then a postmaster. Um, I love being a postmaster, but it was also the worst job I could ever have. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, also. Yeah, you had to deal with unions. You had to deal with people. Uh-huh. Um, 
yeah, that 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 didn't really want to work. And you just look at them going, you know, you have the funnest job in the world. You have, you know, <laughs> it's just why don't you work? And yeah. but it but other than that, I mean it was it was great to be out in front of the public. And the first opportunity I had, I you know, the, the earliest opportunity I have, which was in 2010, using my active duty, I never showed them my guard paperwork. If I had 20 years, they wouldn't let me buy in. So I used my active duty paperwork and I bought 12 years um, and I retired in 2010. And you know, then, you know, I, I had remarried by that time, um, probably to the most wonderful woman in the world. Um, good Texas girl. She worked the oil field. And when I retired, we were comfortable. And but every time she'd come home, um, I would have the house cleaned, the furniture rearranged or I'd have a new tattoo. And she right. looked at me, she goes, <laughs> you need a job. And so, you know, so I also started going back to college online and I, I picked up a degree in, in, in inventory management and, and like, and so I started doing contract work for small companies, for okay. oil field companies. You know, it was work a year here, work of the year there. Um, and, and, you know, start, you know, it was, it was good money just brought in, you know, bought in enough to buy scuba equipment. and. Then I started working, you know, picked up, you know, picked up another degree in business management. And then I started getting bigger contract jobs, you know, started bringing in, started bringing in one hundred and twenty five to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, minimum five years. But with contracts saying, if I do the job you want, you know, in less that time, you still pay me for the five years. Nice. And, and yeah, so it was you know, great write ups. You know, it's. You know, great way to write contracts. Learn that from the business side of the business managed side of the deal. Yeah. So now, now I decided in 2018 that I'm done. We're done. Um, and so, and then I that's when I started really focusing on the the scuba part. And when I talked to you earlier about I do side hustles. Yeah. And yeah. The side one of the side hustles is um, with the scuba background I have. I have over a thousand dives. Um, there isn't anything I haven't done as a scuba, as a scuba diver. Nice. Um, I do single gas. So I do, I do regular air. I've done multi-gas or trimix. I've done, um, um, closed circuit or what we call, what you guys call the rebreathers. Mm -hmm. And but what I really do, love to do is search and recovery for people that do stupid things like drop stuff in water. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, there's, there's people that, you know, they go out, they go, they go fishing or they go out and party and they'll drop their iPhones or their iPads in the water. Mm -hmm. They're ruined except for your, your itty bitty little circuit that has all your pictures on it and stuff like that. So, you know, they've lost their $1,500 iPad, but that little itty bitty, um, you know, little circuit in there, their, your little, um, thing, it has a lot of family pictures on it. So I'll get called at certain times of the night saying, help. And so I'll drive to wherever they are. When I show up, it's already $200. Yeah. You know, and then we'll, I'll talk to them and they'll say, and I go, before I put my equipment on, okay, what are you looking for? Well, my wife dropped her iPad. And I go, iPad's useless. And they go, we know, but it has all the family pictures. And I give them, okay, when I put my gear on, it's already 200 bucks. It's $200 an hour after that. Are you sure? <laughs> like, yes, the photos are worth that much. Okay, because it's it's grandma. She died two years ago. Sure. And yeah, you know, I have I have techniques. I'm well trained on search and um, search and rescue, search and recovery. Mm -hmm. And so um, I could tell you the te techniques, but it's it's most divers know what the techniques are. Sure. And yeah, so it's it's yeah, it, real simple. I drop the line at the last known location. Um, it's got a heavy, heavy weighted line. I put a buoy on top and I start my search from there. And it's usually, I can usually find it with, within, you know, within 15 to 30 minutes. Oh, but nice. since it's, you know, since it's, yeah, since it's 200 bucks an hour, it's 200 for me to show up, 200 bucks an hour, you know, it's a $400 night. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's that simple, but that's basically me in a nutshell. This was fascinating. I, I love just the diversity of your career paths. You know, I mean, you, it's pretty amazing. Um, is there anything you're working on right now? Do you have any like um, any passions as far as like charity or any kind of like um, associations or anything that's like um, anything you work on in that regard? 
I mean, the TACP Association is probably my my big passion right now. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. I jumped into it when Marcus Mater um, became president. Yeah. You know, they were looking for, you know, that's right when the retired regional reps got started. Oh, right. And right. they said, we need, vol- we need volunteers. Of course, dad's biggest advice, volunteer for everything. Right. And so I jumped up and said, you know, pick me. If not me, who? Sure, um, sure. And so we started it, um, you know, and yeah, you know, we didn't know where we were going. And so we just we wrote rules as we went. And met some good guys on the phone. That's when I first met K-12. Yeah. Um, there was a funeral, funeral going on for, for a re, uh, retired tech P. And I met met quite a few good guys down at Fort Hood where he got buried. And, you know, and unfortunately missed uh, Chief Rankin at that time. He and I had been conversing with each other before then on, on the net. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, but uh yeah, met quite a few. Got the first time I'd seen act a group of active duty TAC P in a long time, and that right. that made my heart swell to <laughs> see how far they they far they grew. And that's the first time I've seen alos that were dressed in in unbloused boots and 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 regular field caps. Oh, and yeah, so I was yeah. like, wow, that changed because when I was in every if you were a TAC assigned to a TAC P, everybody wore blouse blues. Everybody wore the black beret and mm-hmm. with flash with flag and crest, um, you know, including supply, including 304s. And oh, okay. if you were a sign with back the unit, everybody wore it. Oh, um, okay. you now it was, you know, but you know, it was, it was just the way they wrote the regulation. It, I don't sure. know what year they changed that, but I never, <laughs> it's like, I wish they would have done that earlier. <laughs> right. But, you know, at that time, it was just a matter of getting it, pushing it through air force channels. Yeah. So it was, it was good. So, I mean, yeah, I'm, it was a good change, but uh, and so now, like I said, last this October was the first time I was able to attend any reunion at all. Um, it was my first time my wife got to see um, any a large group of tech peas. Now, let me take a step back. Um, my wife is originally from the Lubbock area. Okay, the only Air Force people she ever knew growing up were her stepfather, who was a um, it was a flight instructor at Reese Air Force Base. Okay. And so he had met him and a few other, you know, young second lieutenants who were going through flight school there. Mm-hmm. Um, they flew the old T-33s. Okay. Other than that, she knew very little about the Air Force. When she met me, um, it was in 2001. Um, I had her convinced because I didn't want her to know about my sordid and jaded past. Um, <laughs> that I was a clerk typist in the air force. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, and, and she believed me completely. Sure. And then people started, you know, people started showing up in the doors, guys like J Mac, um, yeah. guys from the old emergency services team. And then they start telling stories once we, especially once we started getting an, um, J Mac being John McKay, they started telling stories and I'm like, who are you going to believe? The man you're soon going to marry, or these drunk bastards, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> so, uh, so she got to meet uh, quite a few guys, and then you know she finally got to meet uh, um, Tommy Case. And, uh, and yeah. Tommy, uh, let me tell you, Tommy, um, Tommy and I had never met before that, face to face before then. Um, how Tommy and I met was uh, I I'd taken my grandson up to Texas Tech to go to Texas Tech football camp. Mm-hmm. Now, as we were checking in, I see this tall, lanky man leaned up against the wall with the dead eyes, you know, and he was wearing a sweatshirt that had the old style two bat um, on it, the, the, the diamond with the two and the orange background. Okay. I mean, he was a thousand miles away. I know the look. I've lived that look. Mm-hmm. Um, and I lean, I, I see him. The, the grandson's already is, is checking in, doing what he needs to do, get them. And I, and I lean, I, I walk over and lean back against the wall right beside me. He's not noticing me. So I make the comment. So do you earn that or did you just buy it at the PX? <laughs> and he stood up, swung over to me and, and he's getting ready to knock my head off. Right. I go, Hi, my name's John Hosey. I was with third battalion 75th temporarily. 
you know, from, yeah. I was, you know, Dan Hannigan had me come over. That's another story. Um, and he smiled and, and he goes, Hey, you know, Tommy case or JT Taylor. And he, then he started spouting off and I go, those names sound familiar. <laughs> so I go, Oh, I was the second bat. And, and, and he tells me his whole life story in 30 seconds. Nice. And you know, his, his name was, his, his name was Grady Doyle. He was a, he was actually a clerk admin that and Ranger tab third admin. He had done, he had done several tours with, with, uh, with second bat. Um, he was a sergeant first class at the time, and he had gone to school at Nick Nimi with with Tommy. You know, oh, okay. so him and Tommy were lifelong friends. Wow! And and of course, Tommy was a That's... third. And I didn't, you know, I really didn't know Tommy well as, except through legends. Sure, sure. And uh, yeah, so and you know, so and what a small and, world. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah, and so you know, we we started talking. He was going to Texas Tech, it, and through Bootstrap to become a second lieutenant and his plan was to go back to the bats nice. well just before he got his 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 uh his uh, butter bar he was told oh no you can't go back to the bats we can't do that you know you're you're too familiar so we're going to make you a cab scout you know deflated his whole world yeah you know so they sent him to el paso um and they medical him out from there he showed up at my door one day and he was he was undiagnosed you know you know that look yeah and so we spent I, I was you know that was when i was in between in between my my contract stuff so every day he would he would be here and and we started killing every day start killing a bottle a large bottle of of jameson's irish because i needed to bring both of us down to the same level <laughs> um to where we could we could start talking and we drank so much that both of us starting lose started losing days of the week. I knew he knew Tommy, you know, because because obviously I go through the Rangers, right. you know, to, you know, because he had mentioned him, and I saw him I'm on on the friends list, and I and I next time we had a chance to talk over the phone, I go, so how do you know Tommy? You know, he's a legend in our career field, and he goes, oh no, Tommy and I are lifelong friends. I've known him since since school. <laughs> You're shitting me. He's like, oh no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm just that's bananas. And, and so yeah, I mean, you know, I sent a friend request to 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 Tommy, and I go, Grady says hi. He goes, <laughs> how the hell do you know Grady? <laughs> Long story. Yeah. And then so that's how Tommy and I became friends. And wow. um, I became friends with Grady's mom, his his two kids, his mom, his mo when he when he passed away, God rest his soul. Um, he he developed the same neurological disease I had from TBIs. Um, and he should not have been taking a shower by himself, but he did passed out, cracked his head, uh, bled out. Um, oh my God. But, uh, I hear that. Yeah. I was, I was the third call his mom made. Wow. And, you know, and Tommy case was the first phone call I made. That's was, a shame. Yeah, we, so when I, when I met Tommy at the, uh, at the reunion, man, we, it was, yeah. It was like, you know, it, we talked and hugged each other like we were brothers. And so now, now he's, I classify him as my little brother. Nice. So he's he's you know, just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Oh, yeah. He's the best. Yeah, he's the best. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, I really appreciate you taking your time. And that's quite a, quite a wrap up there. And that's kind of, it's just amazing. Um, that these connections that we have, you know, you never know when they're going to happen. And I've, I'm sorry. I really am sorry to hear that he passed. I, that was unexpected. I didn't think that was going to be part of the story, but yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. But it kind of like give you, you and Tommy that connection, you know, that uh, now you guys can kind of talk about him and, and remember him. But yeah, I can't, like I said, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really, I really do appreciate it. This was, this is great. Well, Brady, I can't thank you enough for you doing what you're doing. I mean, you're bringing meat and bones into a history that we need to, we need to talk about. Yeah. So that so the, the guys and the kids, you know, that are growing up and coming into our field know, you know, know know our real history because we're missing out a lot. Oh, for and, sure. And so you're you're bringing you're bringing the legends, you know, and the people that we know to life. Well, it's my pleasure. I, like I tell everybody, I love doing it. I, I love sitting down with guys like you and hearing history of the career field and 
all the guys, how they interacted, and uh, you know, it's just it's amazing. So it's it's my, all my pleasure over here. If you ever have any, have any questions at any time, text me, call me, and and so then if you can't get a hold of people um, from the old days, I can get them. Jack's going to give you a big list. I uh, said he got off the phone with just got off the phone when I contact with him okay. of three guys that were three oh fours and and you know that, that would love to spill their story. That'd be great. That'd be awesome. Uh, they are more than any. Jack's more than welcome. Any of those guys are more than welcome to come on anytime. I'd love to. I'd love to talk okay. to him. Okay. Cool. All right, so brother. Have a good weekend. Thank you very much. Hey.